former executive producer of Hello. BBC Media Action, currently advisor and creative director for Come Hello. Together. He will be talking about the future of media. Please welcome our first speaker. Jumripsu, everybody. Can you hear me? Looking at you, honestly, I feel that I should not be here. I must be the oldest person in this room. Um, but I have the experience of having worked quite a lot exclusively with young people, and I tell you, that's my secret. That's what keeps me young. So I'm really glad to be here. I really want to thank Jolie and the amazing Project Inspire team, I mean, honestly, for giving me the privilege to be here today in front of you. Okay, quick introduction. There it is. I came here in 2003, and we set up the BBC office then. And as you can see, I'm still here. I think that's just proof of how much I love being in Cambodia and working here, especially with young people. <clears throat> Thank you. So I have a presentation here. Hopefully, we can finish it in the time that we have, and it's not too boring. OK. Does that work? There. Hello. OK. All right. The topic was given to us by Jolie, and we kind of talked about it yesterday, saying peace is, is such a big, it's such a vast topic, and how can we cover it in the short time that we have? So I think each of the three speakers, we split it up to talk about it in three different perspectives. Whatever is most useful to the audience here today, as young people, looking forward in your lives and questioning yourselves, what is the element and what is the significance of peace in your lives? And because we are all, in a sense, media experts, the whole thing is focused as how can you promote peace or propagate peace through the use of media? All right. So the question is, first of all, what is peace? I mean, most people know that peace means that there is no war or there is no conflict. That's the simple definition, right? But, I mean, as we all know, that's not just it. There's much more to it. I keep forgetting. Yeah, so this is the closest definition I can find for me that I think is very satisfactory. Peace is when people are able to resolve their conflicts without violence. But the one thing we must realize is that as human beings, as people, we will have conflicts no matter what. We can never avoid it. That's just our nature, right? You cannot imagine a world without conflicts. Why? Different countries, different cultures, different points of view, different likes, dislikes, everybody is different. So if one person says yes, the other person says no. If one person likes white, the other person likes black. That's just the way we are, and we should be that way. So as soon as you bring these two disparate views together and put it in one room, you start having conflict. But the point is, it can be peaceful, right? It can be peaceful if you can resolve that without violence. And that is the key. So I just want to ask you, we'll do a small test here. Okay. <clears throat> Ronaldo versus Messi. How many for Ronaldo? Raise your hands. How many for Messi? See? It's just... <laughs> Just in this group, you have these two. That's a very interesting example because Ronaldo and Messi, both of them, they're not Cambodian. We don't even know who the hell they are. We just see them on the TV screen, right? And they're great at what they do. They play great football. But I have been to these sessions where we watch it on a big screen with friends. And these guys are supporting Ronaldo. These guys are supporting Messi. And when the match ends and one of them wins, there's almost a fight that happens there <laughs> between these two guys. It's very strange, isn't it? But people, they are so strong with their beliefs and their convictions. And they want the world to be the way they want it. And therefore, this whole point of conflict will always keep arising in our lives. So you should be able to resolve it without violence. But I think this probably is the more important part of what peace really means. That you can work together to improve the quality of your lives. So, just say that there is no war happening in Cambodia. Cambodia went through, I think, one of the most horrific tragedies uh, in the human history with the Khmer Rouge regime 40 years ago. Today, it's, we, we, it's very peaceful. It's a past memory. But is it really peaceful in the way that you want it? Is it complete in itself? To be complete as peace, it should be that people should work together to improve the quality of your lives, right? So, quick definition, move it on. Right. 
the other human quality is that we have to communicate with each other. We like to talk. We have to. It's a human need. We cannot sit silent, right? The moment you start opening your mouth and you have something to say, the other person has a different set of mind, different uh, priorities, and when they say something back to you, the communication process starts. It can be very united for a while, or it can be very conflicting. So, what happens is this. If two people are talking, they can have a fight, and they can resolve it themselves if they can. If not, somebody else, a friend, will come and say, hey, 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 come on, don't do this, guys, and then he'll try, they'll try to mediate, and then they'll resolve that conflict for them. But when you multiply it in a society or a country, you need a means, and that's what media is all about, you need a means to deliver that message or to deliver that, that point of view to a large mass of people. So media is what humans we have created in order to communicate these things in a large setting, right? Yeah, so the, the root for the word media comes from medi, and it means middle. So mediator means somebody who's in the middle, who mediates. But there's a very interesting connotation to this word, especially if you are a person that works in media, and it is your role to produce it for the benefit of your audience. We'll talk about it later. So, as we know, media, everybody knows it. We know it from mass media, we know it from broadcasting, the electronic media, like television and radio and print, these magazines and, and newspapers. And now the internet has stepped in and kind of disrupted everything. We also know it as interpersonal media, posters, pamphlets, people, things people put in your hands, or, or you know, big billboards that are trying to send you a message or advertising. So the thing to know is it doesn't matter whether it's broadcasting, you're reaching out to a large mass or a smaller group of people. Media has always been, and that's because we created it for the benefit of humanity. It has been governed by a set of principles. And I think all this, how many of you here study journalism? Yeah, so you know this by heart, right? <laughs> this is your Bible, this is what you follow. Media has to be, and these are the principles that we agreed on when we created this beast. It has to be truthful. It has to be accurate. It has to be objective. You cannot put your personal views into it. You have to watch it from a distance. It has to be impartial. You cannot take sides. It has to be fair, and it has to be accountable. Meaning the person, a journalist who prints something, has to be accountable for what he's printed. In case he's made a mistake, or he's been biased, he has to take responsibility for it. All right? So, guided by these principles, then what does media aim to do? Basically, that's what media aims to do. We all know this. We want to inform people, we want to educate them, and we want to entertain them as well. And uh, it's a bit unfortunate, but in today's time, especially with young people, the priorities have shifted. First, they want to be entertained, <laughs> then they want to be educated a little bit, and they want to be informed about what's happening. It doesn't matter. But the, sort of culmination of all those things, the core thing that we really want is to make an impact on society by educating, entertaining, and informing. So how do we do it? All right, who, who recognizes this? I think all of you are almost too young to recognize this picture, but I can see some people smiling. All right, I think this is explained easier when you see this. Have you seen this? Do you know the song? Yeah. Do you know who that guy is? Yeah, 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 yeah. see? That's globalization for you. <laughs> this happened a long time ago. This was in 1985. The problem was in a country in Africa called Ethiopia, they had a huge famine. Famine means they could not grow enough food and people were hungry and they were dying of starvation. It was their problem, really. A lot of media covered it, BBC and all these. It used to come on television and in the press. The world reacted to it as we do today when we see there's a bombing in, in 
Baghdad or there's mass killings in Nice or whatever, what do we do? We say, so sorry, we change our Facebook profiles to reflect you know, our, our sorrow, change it to the flag of France for a while or something. But that's it. It's a very passive reaction to what you see, what's happening in the media. What happened was, this bunch of American singers, basically, Michael Jackson and his friends, Quincy Jones and Lionel Richie, they just got their friends together, all the singers, and those are the best singers of that time, the most famous, in one room, in one studio, that's it, one day, and they recorded this song. And if you look at the video, this is so old, yes, but even then, it is the most simple thing to do. They just came into the room, there were some cameras, and they shot it. It's production-wise, it doesn't look glossy, it doesn't look fancy. It's nothing that any young kid cannot do today. But what they did was they brought that quality, that number of people into the room. They made a song, and when it came out on television, it wasn't people just were entertained by the song. Yeah, they loved the song, it's a really great song. It was on the top charts, on the billboards and everything. But what the people got was the message that there is something happening very far away from us, and yet, as human beings living on this planet, we are probably responsible in some way to be able to help our other fellow uh, planet dwellers. And so it created a huge media thing around that. And then they did lots of, of course, lots of projects, etc., to help Ethiopia reduce its famine, etc. Okay, so in the same way, me, I, I worked for the BBC as the executive producer for all these years, so I tried to do a little bit of that. Do you know that, what this is? Have you seen Snae Mboon? Okay. Have you seen Lo Mboon? Oops, sorry. Yeah? How many have you seen Lo Mboon? Okay, so, you know. So these are programs that we created for the youth, by the youth, to try and get them to, to feel that they can do something in their society to make a difference, right? So, what did we do? Okay, so one of the first things we said, we were just beginning to figure out what should we do with Loembuan. It was a planning stage. And I said, okay, if we want to talk to young people, let's try and inspire them somehow. And they said, how? I said, I came up with the craziest idea. I said, let's break the world record for something. And everybody said, how can you do that? Breaking the world record is not easy, right? And to tell you the honest truth, it was one of the most easy things to do. So this is what we did. The video? Okay, so one day we got more than a thousand people to come in uh, the Vietnam Park, the Hun Sen Park, and we danced the Mardi Zone together. And we broke the world record, greenest world record, for the largest number of people dancing the Mardi Zone. Now, how easy was that? Cambodians love Mardi Zone. They all know the steps. It's, you don't even have to teach it to them. You just have to tell them to come and be there. So that's what happened, right? So Cambodia had a Guinness world record. You know, it was in our office, very proud. It was basically a showcase of what young people can do if you get together and work together, right? Great example. The problem was this. The problem was it didn't do much good for society. It was fun, it brought a lot of name and honor to the country, but what good did it really do except for the feeling that, yes, we should get together and do something cool, right? So the next year, we said, let's do another thing similar to that, but something more useful. So instead, we did this. We found out that there's a huge problem in Cambodia. The number one killer of young people is traffic accidents. Can you imagine? Unbelievable data. And when you have a traffic accident, they could take, they're taken to the hospital, whatever, and there's a huge shortage of blood that can sustain their lives. So we said, all right, if you want to help young people, let's get help young people to help themselves. Let's try to get 999 young people to donate blood in a, in a number of nine days. And so this is what happened, right? So the people came, and you, that's our 999th donor in the middle, but then we exceeded, it was a 1,048 or something like that, right? The blood bank said, this has never happened before in Cambodia. They're always begging people to say, please come and donate your blood to us, etc. And the point was, it wasn't just the amount of blood that was raised in a short time, 
the media around it made that issue an important issue for people. So the blood bank noticed that after our campaign was over, it continued. People kept coming in numbers which were much larger than they ever saw, continuing to come there and donate blood. So when you're talking about media for peace, media for helping society or changing the world in some way or the other, these are very concrete examples right from Cambodia. So all of that was not possible if we hadn't utilized interpersonal media. We talked to people, we put leaflets out, we talked to PSE school, etc. And of course, we did a lot of sort of advertising on TV. And so that made it possible. So these are the two media we know. And then this happened. The internet came and it disrupted everything in social media. In the old days, it was blur. You had television and you had radio. That was mass media. You could reach millions of people through that. It was very much under our control. So me being the head of TV and executive producer, I could control it to be what I thought is good for the people. And of course, as I said before, I was led by the principles of journalism and media, and I made sure that that was correct. But then this came, and everything becomes haywire. So every time you go to the social media, you don't know who's saying what. There's total freedom, there's total anarchy. So, you know this, right? I'd like to hear from you, two people, what do you use social media and why you use it? So any volunteers? Quick. Raise a hand if you want to tell me. What social media do you use and why you use it? Nobody? Uh oh, so shy. There we go. My name is Daryl. Uh, I use Facebook yeah. uh, to keep in touch with my friends and also check some update news and also uh, uh, watch the, what my friend doing friends every doing. day. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Somebody else? A girl, a lady? My name is Watai and for social media, I use Google. And uh, most of you here may use that too. And the reason why is that Google is the, the most global one. And uh, in that, in, it contains any information that regarding any educational um, uh, knowledge or even uh, any documentary in the, in the world as well. So thank you. Thank you. Very good reasons. In a public setting, this is what people say. And the, both of them were very good reasons. I use this for information and updates on what my friends are doing. I use it because there's a lot of educational information. The reality is this. They actually use it just for fun a lot of the times. And this is waste time, right? <laughs> so social media has been called the weapons of mass distraction because people spend so much time. And there's so many of them. It's, there's not just Facebook. A same one person will have a Facebook account, a Twitter account, a Tumblr account. YouTube, whatever. And I personally have seen when working in the office of how much time people spend on those platforms. Sometimes I think it's very useful because they get a lot of information they wouldn't have otherwise. A lot of the times it's a huge waste of time. Anyway, so I think one thing we need to realize is the difference between traditional media and social media. Traditional media, as I said, was very controlled. It was usually owned by the government or some big private company and they decided what to tell you how the world was. And suddenly social media came up, now everybody is a journalist, everybody is, is a media person, right? You feel everybody's got a mobile phone that, that can shoot video and you, know, you can record stuff. It's so easy, everybody has become a content producer. All right, really? <laughs> okay, so the whole point is the future of media, if I must say, is going to be social media. Whatever you're doing is going to expand exponentially into the future. The technology is going to improve, but to end my, my presentation, you, it doesn't matter what the technology does, the core principles of media go right back to what I said right in the beginning, that you have to maintain the core principles of good journalism and media to keep it useful for the people. Thank you very much. <laughs>